it's Doug Atkinson here at Solutions Review, and I want to thank all of the expert moderators and panelists for being a part of these Insight Jam discussions today. The launch of InsightJam.com has been incredibly rewarding with all of the contributions we're receiving from the experts and solution providers and end users. Uh, it's really been quite a sight to see. If you haven't joined InsightJam.com already, please do. And if you have, please invite some of your colleagues to join as well. And again, thanks very much for being here and enjoy today's discussions. Solutions Review presents Inside Jam, a social media community for enterprise technology. Hello and welcome back to Mini Jam Live. My name is Jonathan Paula. I am the director of multimedia and events here at Solutions Review. And I'm excited to introduce our next panel of the day, Closing the Gap in Cybersecurity in the Boardroom. We have a great group of gentlemen joining me from around the planet. Mackenzie, Aaron, Asaf, Bob, Brad, and Will. Thank you all, one and all, for being here. Really appreciate your time. Uh, looking forward to this discussion. We'll start with some introductions, as we always do. Mackenzie, you've agreed to moderate, so let's get uh, you going first. 30 seconds or so, tell the audience a bit about yourself and uh, professional background. Sure thing. So my name is uh, Mackenzie. As you said, I am the uh, advocate for product and security at Get Guardian. I've been with Get Guardian since... Really the early days, uh, about four and a half years now. Before that, I was the founder and CTO of a startup in Australia called Compago, which uh, still kicking to deck. All right, excellent. Let's head over to uh, Aaron next. Hi there. Uh, I'm Aaron Brongersma. The team here inside of Checkpoint, uh, they refer to me as AB. There's not a, not a lot of uh, Brongersmas that are around, so uh, <laughs> it's kind of a difficult last name for folks. But uh, I lead the Cloud Security Center of Excellence, which uh, we were joking on the pre-call is uh, is definitely a mouthful. Um, but well, the way I like to describe it to folks is that um, you know my team is kind of the the tip of the spear for resolving high impact and uh, and you know and high <clears throat> visibility customer issues inside of Checkpoint's cloud organization. So we see everything from global telcos. Uh, even down to uh, you know small SMB customers. If it's important to our customers, uh, my team's probably in there helping out. So thanks for having me on the call today. You're very welcome. Uh, let's over to Asaf next. Hi, so uh, I'm Asaf Sagi. I'm the head of product here at Cyberity. Um, Cyberity is a company uh, that provides cybersecurity awareness training for other companies. So uh, we help uh, train employees uh, not fall for phishing and uh, other various uh, attacks. Excellent. And let's head over to Bob. Hi, Bob Maley. I'm the Chief Security Officer of Black Kite, a cyber risk intelligence company. I've been here five years, came on board with the uh, seed round of funding, uh, but I've been in the industry quite a long time. Prior to that, I was at PayPal. I was their global head of third party cybersecurity risk management. Uh, before there, uh, Chief Security uh, Information Security Officer, at Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. If I go back far enough into another uh, century, um, I came out of law enforcement. Excellent. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, Brad, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. My name is Brad Taylor. I'm a founder and CEO of Proficio. We're a global managed detection and response company, also providing SOC services. Uh, and I've been in the industry, I'm going to date myself, uh, for about 30 years in cybersecurity now. I uh, had the good fortune to be at a couple of early stage companies that went through IPOs with RSA Security and ArcSight and uh, brought some of my uh, team skills and knowledge over to Proficio to provide those SOC services to our customers on a global basis. I uh, greatly appreciate your time. Thanks. Absolutely. And who do we have next? Uh, I believe Will. Hey, thanks for having me. Will Santiago here, Senior Vice President of Black Point Response Operations Center. Black Point Cyber is a managed detection and response company similar to Proficio. Uh, my background really is rooted in government, former national security analyst, and then used to be in the Navy. So lots of experience doing practicing uh, cybersecurity. Awesome. Well, thank you again, one and all, for being here. Really appreciate uh, uh, your time, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So I'm going to get out of the way and let you get to that. Uh, Mackenzie, uh, let's kick it off with our first question. Absolutely. Well, it's uh, it's great great to be here. So as the, the topic of this discussion suggests, we're talking about the knowledge gap. Uh, but particularly in the boardroom at the uh, kind of upper level of the of of organizations and i guess the first question that i really want to put to the panel to kick us all off is really understanding what is the cybersecurity knowledge gap in the boardroom what you know what is people's experience of this oh, i'm going to pass it over to to aaron uh, up first what's you know what what do you consider the 
the knowledge gap in the boardroom? Yeah. Uh, so I would think that the knowledge gap in the boardroom, at least my experiences, because I have kind of an interesting uh, perspective. Uh, I would say that, you know, from the individual contributor side of the house, the folks that actually have to implement these uh, these strategies and solutions, uh, I think that there's, uh, I would consider the boardroom still very much a black box uh, to the boots on the ground. And so, you know, one of the things that I was hoping to get out of this session here today was to help kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and show some more of the individual contributors and the folks out there that are in the field, uh, you know, implementing these strategies for larger organizations, uh, what we're doing at that level. I would say that the biggest thing that's that the gap that I'm starting to see is honestly a communications gap. Uh, you know, I think that everything starts with uh, communication. It extrapolates out to some of the uh, the other specific areas. But right now, I think it's a communication out and down out of the boardroom to some of the other teams to uh, gain alignment there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that communication gap, I think that's that's something that really uh, it appears in so many in so many different uh, different ways. And maybe we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. But I, I want to keep going around uh, and we'll, we'll head over to Safe now. What you know, what's the what's the, the gap that you're seeing in, in, in the boardroom? Yeah, so um, we we think that um, board members are not usually detail oriented. They're not part of the day to day um uh operations of, of the company and so they're not really aware of the risks um that are posed on individuals whether it's employees uh c-level and the board themselves um, because being in such a high position i think um makes them have this false sense of security that it's not going to happen to me i'm not going to fall into this uh fishing stuff or whatever um, but no, we, we see it across the board, you know, uh, low level employees, high level employees, they're all, um, they all pose risk in, in uh, one way or another. Um, and another thing that, um, I've noticed is that board members tend to be highly reliant on technological solutions, um, such as, um, my, the distinguished panel here, um, that, a certain type of software can protect the the organization. That there is a, a protection layer, and you know when when that fails, there is uh, sorry when when that doesn't fail, there is still the human element that can fail. And I think um, it's uh, underemphasized how how vulnerable humans can be in such situations. Do you, do you, do you think um, you know from your perspective, like, a lot of that comes into the communication gap? Something that that Aaron was saying that that perhaps the, the board's not kind of aware of the risks because communication isn't there, or maybe like you know security you know, security professionals using using jargon. Do, do, do you reckon that's been playing into it, uh, Asif? Um, I don't know if, if jargon is is really the barrier here. I think it's just um, general lack of of awareness to the dangers outside. Um, yeah, so I, th I think it's, it's mainly them not being aware that any employee is an attack vector. Um, mm. attacks can come from, from any, any point. Definitely. Yeah. Let's, does someone want to interject really fast, uh, McKenzie and Asaf. Great points, Aaron and Asaf. And, you know, where I sort of see the largest gap in security when it comes to the boardroom is that the boardroom is inundated with risk. Uh, the issue that they're having, though, is actually figuring out what's actually relevant to their business. And True. so there's an aspect of sort of risk management that we refer to as risk intelligence, right? And it's to help drive the board members to understand that, yes, there is a set of inherent cybersecurity risks that we must deal with, but not everything is our problem. Um, and we need to be able to prioritize those problems as they come in with a established sort of program to communicate risk to the business based off of cybersecurity threats uh, to the environment that they're sort of uh, monitoring, right? Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that as well. It's uh, and there's not a consistent framework that's out there for board to actually look at to measure. How do we compare? You know, where's our our value coming? You know, are we truly protected? What's our risk of of an event? You know, what are our mitigating controls? So I think that you know we're all as security professionals trying to help them understand risk. You know, what is the exposure? You know, what is their level of exposure? But when we put together the metrics, there's no consistency from one boardroom to the next boardroom to the next boardroom. But I think it's getting better. I mean, you know, the good news is CISOs are now invited 
to a board meeting before a breach uh, so they can do some level of education, but they don't want to get too metrics oriented. They don't want to get too scary story oriented. You know, they want to frame it in the frame that, you know, business outcomes and a risk framework that a board will understand and, and then continuous education, that communication gap, I think, as you mentioned before, uh, is critical as well. Yeah, I I want to I want to go over to to Bob now. Like Bob, you know, you're chief security officer. You spend time in these boardrooms with you. From you know, you're also one of the ones that that's explaining risk to other C levels and everything. You know, what what's what's the knowledge gap that you kind of see in the board grab when you're when you're in these meetings in these rooms and and discussing? Well, I'm not going to uh, agree. I don't think there's a knowledge gap in the boardroom. There, folks on the board are there to run the company. And where I see the problem is in the, the uh, and if it's the, the CSO or the CISO reporting to the board or a CI, a CEO, that's where I see the failures. And I heard it in the previous conversation. Uh, most folks in cybersecurity are into the metrics. Uh, they're into uh, where the, uh, the threats are to the, the company. They're, they're really not understanding the language of risk. And I talk a lot about the language of risk and the definition. And if you're talking to the board and you're using colored charts, if you're using high, medium, and low, uh, that's where the breakdown is because those things really are very qualitative. And most board members that, that I know are a little bit more quantitative. And it's lost in translation. Most security folks who try to talk to the board, uh, when they're done, the board goes, well, we trust this person. And we hope what he's telling us is accurate, but we really don't understand it, but we're going to count on him. And I think that's why we see uh, the average uh, length of a CISO position anymore. They're, they're, uh, it used to be four or five years. Now I think I see him turn over a lot more because of that. It, it's in that, that being inarticulate to the board. And, you know, I, I've been in that position previously where following the framework of the company where I worked, I had to talk about the, highs, you know, the high risks were the ones that were the most important and, and it's how they're defined is the problem. Uh, I've learned and it's the, the, our clients that we work with, what we help teach them is let's translate that into the language that the board understands. And the language is usually dollars and cents. It's money. It's, it's the impact of the bottom line. So as, as uh, cyber professionals, uh, having that ability to connect uh, in their own language, in, in a, a very uh, quantitative way uh, and in a, in a meaningful way. I think that's where that gap is. Uh, the CISOs today, they're, some of them are really technical, and that's great. Uh, you know, we need to have that connection to the technical uh, because we have our teams. And then it's the business acumen. Uh, you know, I've, I've kind of seen one or the other. Uh, somebody who becomes a CISO because he really is a very uh, business process oriented person, but doesn't get the technical, doesn't get the underlying risks. Uh, but then that other one who's too technical and, and it's finding that, that nice combination. And good news is uh, CISOs in either bucket, you can learn how to be both. That, that's where I think that gap is. And, and that's the CISO is there to fill. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I really resonate with that. Uh, I'll pass it over. Sorry, who was uh who, who I, I just wanted to echo what Bob was saying. You know, I think yeah. to your point about communication, if you're a technical CISO trying to gain funding for something and you're just going into the boardroom speaking technical jargon, most time you're not going to mm -hmm. secure the funding you need for that project to be able to get through. Because at the end of the day, dollars and cents are what matter. And if you can't justify why I'm going to give you a million dollars to spend on security program, well, I'm not going to give you that money, right? I think ultimately that's where we come down to. Well, they didn't give me the money that I needed to secure something. Well, you didn't do your job at actually pitching why you needed the money. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, it's it's really interesting. I, I love I love the kind of conversation around this because when you look at the title, it's kind of it insinuates that there's a there's a knowledge gap on the on the leadership that they're failing to understand security. But when you're kind of discussing through it, you can see that the the, the knowledge gap is also a translation gap. You know, uh, if Aaron immediately started talking about the communication uh, as well. So this, I think, this also has a big impl imp like big implication on it, being able to translate those those concepts. Um, but but let's talk. Let's dive into now a little bit of kind of you know solution oriented thinking. What there's hurdles to overcome in this. What what's kind of 
what would you guys consider the the main the main hurdle that we need to overcome uh, to be able to start to improve this? And uh, Bob, seen as you were on a on a roll, I'll go I'll go back to you. You know, what are, what are some of the hurdles that uh, that you're seeing to to enable us to kind of close this gap a little bit? Well, it, it's, you know, I talk about quantitative and, and doing quantitative assessments of risk. And, and there's a lot of tools out there that can do that. Uh, there's a number that have, a, you know, CRQ is, is a, a, the buzzword anymore. Uh, but there, there's a number of those that are, are very uh, closed that, uh, again, it, it's uh, the methodology. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in if I use a tool, uh, if I uh, use something that pr- produces a score or a result that, when I present, I want to be able to explain it down to how I came about that, that uh, conclusion, uh, what framework it's based on. That's why I, uh, I believe following open frameworks in the CRQ world, what I use is something called Open Fair. Uh, it, you can uh, license it uh, as, as a, a practitioner. Uh, it's free as, as a company if you're a consultant. Uh, through uh, the uh, open group, they have a number of uh, open standards. So it's, a, it's an open standard there. And you, the use of FAIR for me uh, is, is, has been the game changer. In my previous role uh, at, at PayPal, uh, I didn't really have that. That's, we reported on it in, in high, medium, and lows. And uh, you know, I was a, a, a very uh, pragmatic person, and I assessed third-party risk, and we were yellow according to uh, uh, the framework we had to use. Everything else was red. Uh, so essentially the conversation was always the folks that had a risk theme that was in the red, they were arguing back and forth about, uh, getting funding and getting staff, uh, instead of being realistic. And uh, so that's what I use. That's, uh, uh, it can be challenging, uh, because there, there's, a, uh, and I've seen, seen folks talk about it, that, that you need so much data to be able to do a fair assessment, which is very inaccurate. That's not a true statement. Uh, you can do, you can do very minimal fair assessments. What changes in the results is uh, the uh, confidence level of the output. So having uh, a quantitative assessment with a lower confidence level is miles better than something plucked from the air and, 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 and given a color on a chart. So uh, yeah. again, it, it, it's understanding it, learning how to do it, uh, and then it gives you the ability then uh, when, when you know, you're, you're talking about the uh, uh, when I was a CISO of the Commonwealth a long time ago, I did think differently. I, I used that fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, you know, if you remember Larry Poneman, uh, his uh, cost of a data breach, right? Um, you know, I still remember in, in uh, uh, 2006, the cost of the data was $204 per record. So if my red team, if we found a, uh, a problem in the Commonwealth that we, we saved 200,000 records from being exposed, 200,000 times 204. Oh, look what we've saved the Commonwealth. Uh, I need more money so we can continue this. Uh, yeah. Uh, worked really good. That's 20 years ago. It doesn't work today. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I want to I, I keep going in, in this. You know, uh, I see if you're talking about risk uh, a lot when you were talking about, you know, what is what is the knowledge gas? gap what are you you know what is the the hurdles that you kind of see to kind of overcome that 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 the lack of awareness around risk to 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 bridge that and and i I guess you know yeah could you can you kind of go into what that looks like and how that how that affects the process yeah so it kind of touches on the points that i uh, talked about earlier um that there is not enough awareness that um of the human element in in uh, security breaches so it's not you know there you hear a lot in the news about um you know fancy hacking tools uh breaking into i don't know some chips or some cloud surface this and this or that but um at the end of the day these are highly skilled hackers and um they are you know relatively a few of them and um what we've seen is a lot of the the day-to-day hacking um, the majority in terms of quantity is simply phishing because it's a very, very cost effective way of entering an organization and then, you know, laterally moving in from there. Um, data access is super easy when you you just have the access of a certain person to, to their accounts and whatnot. And um, 
you know, this doesn't usually hit the news as hard as, as you know, this or that breach or uh, some vulnerability in a, in a Java library or whatever. So um, there's not enough awareness of this, like, you know, really, really kitchen table kind of hacking. Um, and um, let me just, I'll share a story of, of my own. Like when I got promoted to, to my role, current role as head of product. Um, so Cyber80, what it does, it, uh, one of the things it does is we send phishing simulations. And when employees uh, click on the links in those phishing simulations, they get to a landing page with some training content. So this is, you know, this is what I do day to day. And when I, uh, the day I got promoted, or maybe that same week, um, I got an email uh, suddenly um, alerting me of some office supplies issue that I need to approve. And I like almost clicked the link and I'm like, wait a minute, this is a, this is one of our simulations. I got hit by our simulation. I almost clicked it just because I got distracted for a second and like I was worried about um, a new uh, issue. So this can really hit anyone. And I think um, one of the problems in the in the knowledge gap is that board members are not aware that this could happen to them. This could happen really to anybody. Um, and it doesn't need to be like a, a higher up. It could be any employee with some access to to IP or to uh, accounts where they can you know spend money, that kind of stuff. So the the human layer is very very important, I think, and and it doesn't get enough of a, a buzz in the news. Yeah, I mean, I like I, I tend to agree. Is is when we see a big breach, we can focus on the technical steps that they took, forgetting that the initial access was often. A human clicking you know we can look at massive supply chain attacks like you know when circle ci was breached it all stemmed from an employee getting malware on their computer likely through a phishing campaign um, but we tend to focus on the other steps that were taken uh in the media um aaron i i i kind of see you nodding along to here you know what what are some of the main hurdles that you see and you know, you're talking about communication and all that you know how, how do you see you know, this communication and, and building on what Asif was saying about uh, perhaps uh, the board members not understanding, you know, the total scope of the risk and the human element of it. Yeah, I, you know, Asaf, you've, you've, you've hit the nail on the head, like simple, like the Occam's razor approach. Um, that pragmatic approach is the best bang for your buck for anyone starting any, any task, right? But like apply it to, to this p particular domain you know, like cross your T's and dot your dot, dot your I's, right? Like, um, and I've talked a lot of, about this with folks because what happens is a lot of times you get different generations of builders and things like that building applications, uh, especially now that you see generative AI hit the table, um, that, you know, things that should have been common sense checkboxes just get passed up. But, um, but one thing I did want to hit home here, I know I got to, I want to keep this kind of focused, is that I think that sometimes organizations from, maybe from inside the boardroom, but maybe just on the other end of that, um, take on a too ambitious of a project where they can't get the flywheel starting, where the project takes too long, the deliverables are taking too long. And I think that that's once, once again, where if you start looking at the, the, the keep it simple, stupid methodology, right? And you take some of these simple, easy to implement technologies, programs, best practices, and get repeatable wins with that, I think that starts building up your credibility so that people do build the trust, but then that also get, allows you to have that communication uh, channel. And I think that that's essential to, to solving some of these, prob these problems. Yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely. Uh, Will, I want to, I want to head over to you now because I mean, you're, you're in, uh, you're in the SOC, you're in the operation rooms uh, dealing, dealing with, with this, you know, what, what are some of the main hurdles that, that you see? Because I guess you see the aftermath of, or the, re the result of, you know, the communications not happening in, in, in these operations as breaches are happening. Well, you know, what do you think are the main hurdles that need to be overcome? You're on mute. Uh, we'll, uh, you're on mute. So. I think I'm good to go now. So yeah, no, yeah you're good. <laughs> it, has, uh, it has to happen at least once, right? <laughs> it has to happen at least once. Let me you check know, that off on my bingo. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. What I'll say about that is that, you know, thankfully in my position at Black Point Cyber, I get to interact with our partners 24 seven um, on various yeah. amount of issues. The one sort of thing that I see as being a consistent trend is that oftentimes security is an afterthought. And so, you know, I always have conversations with customers about, well, only if I would have done this, if only I would have relayed this risk 
Uh, if only I would have procured this one tool. And I think the one area that we really need to see sort of uh, enhancements or improvements is what we just previously talked about was those communication barriers between, hey, the board is here to run the business, right? The security team, they're there to be the security team for the company, but the security team can't be an afterthought for the board. And so there needs to be a place for the security team to really sit with the board, right? And it wasn't until much recently that CISOs weren't really invited to meet with the board members, right? Um, and now we're starting to see more and more where that's become the standard. The CISOs are in the meetings, they're sitting down with the board, but at the end of the day, it's about business operations, business continuity. And one area where I see a big sort of hurdle is there is this consistent issue with prioritization. And the prioritization has to be in line with what the business objectives are. If you're in a business that's in constant M&A and you're constantly acquiring other companies, well, you might need to have a process internally on your security team to validate the companies you're not you know, purchasing aren't already compromised, right? You're introducing new risks. Those are just examples that I think over time I've seen multiple iterations of where the security team and the board team aren't on the same page when it comes to the strategy. Mm. Yeah, strategy. I, li I like that. Brad, I want to take it over to you because, I mean, not only are you an executive in the company, but you also communicate with, you know, with the board, with other mm -hmm. members of of these teams and, and relay information. You know, what, what do you think is the main over the hurdle to overcome when dealing with the knowledge gap? Yeah, and, and great question. And I, I think we've got a lot of really good information. I think, you know, using uh, FAIR as a framework is, is a great solution to give kind of consistently uh, you know, information and show that, you know, how are we improving over time, you know, uh, from our risk profile. But sometimes, you know, as, as Will said, you know, we're on the front lines. We see what happens every single day. And, and you know, companies will spend more and more for security and they still get compromised on a weekly or monthly basis. They get attacked every single day. And so, you know, the question often comes, you know, when something pops up in the news, like a couple of more recent big breaches, is how did that happen to them? Can it happen to us? And then what's the effect of that? So I think the, the CISOs need to be prepared to answer some of those questions. So it's more of a, you know, being informed and providing that information to the boards on a consistent basis, as well as the, you know, the programmatic, you know, risk framework profiles and all that kind of good stuff. But it's, you know, things along the lines of, you know, attackers are working 24 by seven, even if your business is nine to five. Uh, most mm -hmm. of the breaches occur in, in off hours. So, you know, I may require 24 by seven detection and response. Uh, I, I may need to do some other things to look at what is my uh, risk exposure and some level of offensive uh, protection. Um, you know, there's another thing that, that I think most companies don't realize is the concept of defense in depth. There might be, you know, two major solutions that you'll use for ERP or for finance, but there's hundreds, if not thousands of different security products that the security team is challenged to try and figure out how to piece these all together. And then there's a gap of cybersecurity professionals to understand that. So I think understanding the challenges of a CISO, you know, kind of the moving target, how the industry is moving are all things that boards you know, want to have some awareness too. You don't want to go into, you know, deep details and scary things. But I think there's, you know, a level of understanding that what are they reading in the news? How does that apply to us? And what are the challenges, you know, that a CISO faces on a regular basis? Uh, it is probably some of the knowledge that needs to be filled in into the gaps as well. Yeah. Br Br Brad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick stick to you uh, here mm -hmm. because I, I, mean, like, I really kind of resonate with, with what you're saying. And I guess kind of the next obvious question is, you know, why, you know, what is the risk of, of not closing closing this gap? You know, if we, we take a look at it and we've dealt with a lot of what that gap can be, communication, not understanding risk, not understanding human elements, you know, re relying too much on tools and all these different areas. But, you know, what's the ultimate goal in, in trying to close and trying to close this gap? What and, and, I, and, the, and the more poignant question is, what's the risk if we don't close this gap? Yeah, and that's that's a great question. Well, you know, as a board member, I don't want to surprise, you know, and and a breach, you know, while you talk about it is still going to be that surprise and and that cost that somewhere wasn't expected. And to think that cyber insurance is always going to cover it is a different story today as well. Um, so, you know, boards don't want surprises. So you've got to, you know, educate them. You've got to give them you know, information that this could happen and then test, you know, I mean, uh, most boards are saying 
are we doing, you know, penetration testing, but you know, they want more regular testing, you know, of cyber exposure. They more, they want more things like breach and attack simulation. Let's simulate this and show me the results. You know, how do we uh, respond? And so I think, you know, uh, the question is, you know, we, we need to continue to educate and provide knowledge, but we need to test and, and be aware. And then also, you know, don't pretend that it's not going to happen to us. It's just how do we respond to it? Yeah, I think that is a mistake that, uh, you know, often you know, people make is that, you know, like the, it, that that doesn't happen to us. We we have the team and, and understanding that, you know, in the in the world of supply chain attacks and everything, you can do everything perfectly and still fall full, full, full to, a, to a victim. Um, Will, I'm going to come back to you now because you, you, you know, you finished up on on talking, you know, a little bit about strategy, and I kind of really liked the direction that you were heading in that. So, uh, you know, from from your perspective, you know, what is the ultimate goal of closing the gap? What what's at risk if we don't close the the, the, the knowledge gap? So, in my opinion, you know, the reason we need to close the knowledge gap is to prevent really in three different things: significant financial loss trust to the company or the company's reputation, and then ultimately legal repercussions, right? We know that if you do not do what you're supposed to say or you, what you're saying you're doing, you will face legal repercussions. There have been CISOs that have been sued for right or wrong because they said they were doing something that they were not actually doing, right? And so the board needs to be aware of what their companies are doing or not doing. There needs to be a validation of that, right? And I think when we talk about validation and strategy, what the board needs to see from these very security technical minded people is the strategy and the implementation and how they're dealing with the issues that are being presented to them from the business perspective. If you have compliance needs and you're HIPAA compliant, well, hey, how are we protecting our HIPAA data, right? I think at a minimum, we need to give the board the level of, of, of uh, awareness to be cyber smart, right? I don't need them to be experts on everything, but I need them to know, hey, we're in this business and we're bounded by these compliance frameworks, which means we need X, Y, and Z. You need to be aware of the implications if something does happen comparative to the compliance requirements for reporting or whatever the case may be. We could face a finish, uh, you know, sort of a significant financial loss if we do not do the right things the right way. Yeah, yeah, That's and uh, you touched a you touched a nerve there, I'm sure, with the you know like the 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 size of getting sued because I mean this is a this is a topic I'm sure we could we could <laughs> we we could talk a, you know a lot a lot about it, the implications of that. <laughs> you know, one, just to digress slightly, you know, one of the challenges that uh, you know we've I've faced in the past is um, trying to explain vulnerabilities to people and them not wanting to understand it because basically they lose plausible deniability if they understand that they have a significant risk, you know, if, and if they don't understand it, then, <laughs> but anyway, right. Uh, right. I, I, that's, what thinking, though. that's if, and, and that comes out of the banks that they used to do that. Don't tell me plausible deniability. That doesn't fly yeah. anymore. And the problem is trying to explain vulnerabilities because just because something's vulnerable doesn't mean that it's exploitable. Mm, um, true. Having that, that intelligence yeah. to, to exactly know what you're talking about. Yeah. You get how many times do you all you guys also get asked? Can you show me the return on prior investments? So that's one of the things that I get asked quite a bit. Is you know how do we show you know yeah we've done all these great things, but what's the return on that investment? What's the return on the people that I hired, the tools that I've implemented, the services that I've acquired? Because if you're going to look for more, uh, you got to show that you've had that return on, on the prior you know things that you've spent in. Uh, you know, yeah, we're more secure and yeah, we have less risk. And those are, are great ways to begin to do that. But I think that's also one of the challenges we face in in closing that gap of education. Yeah, I, I mean, and and I guess, is that part of the, the ultimate goal for kind of closing this gap is so that everyone can be aligned on on that strategy so that everyone, you know, is aware of the actual implications of, of these of these breaches and the cost, and I and I, and I I feel like people shy away from that that they don't want to always return things to to dollars and cents. But you know we need to, and if we want people to relate to it, I feel like we 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 absolutely need to. I think it's more of a strategy gap than it is a knowledge gap, to be honest with you. 
Yep. Maybe, Probably yeah. right there. Yeah. And well, we can yeah. always turn to AI, right? We we've been 30 minutes on <laughs> haven't talked about that. <laughs> All right. Who had who had AI on their bingo card? Oh, That's another God. one that we, should, <laughs> that we yeah. can go through. Free yeah, space. Well, I, <laughs> seriously, well, I, the, well, strat I, the strategy that I see, and I've written about this. I, I wrote a book about the uh, military strategy, uh, observe, orient, decide, and act, the OODA loop in cybersecurity. I'm, yep. I'm publishing a blog tomorrow about uh, entropy that, uh, uh, you know, ent low entropy, that is cybersecurity, that's risk management. We have all these standards, all these frameworks. We're doing the same thing over and over, uh, and we're really comfortable. It makes us feel good, and we can report to the board about that. But the bad guys, they have high entropy, very chaotic, and they're they're killing us, uh, you know, mm. We spent all this time. I'm going through FedRAMP right now. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be on my tombstone. Here lies Bob. Here, FedRAMP ATO. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it, it increases the expense to the government getting good companies. But does it really change the the, the, the level? And I, I don't think it does. We're, we're, we are not as agile. It's an agility yep. gap. It's not the knowledge gap. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, let's let's take a, a see if you know. Do you kind of agree with 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 this that the you know that the knowledge gap you could and you, I guess you could even say the knowledge gap leading has led to uh, you know the strategy or agility gap. Uh, as, as if you know from your perspective, is from what you're seeing in the tools and the and the hands-on kind of fishing campaigns that you that you've been running. Do you know, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Um... I, re I really agree with any everything that that's been said so far. Like it's it's a financial risk, it's a legal risk, uh, reputational risk, of course. And I think when trying to justify the budget for cybersecurity, it's really hard to to show that return if nothing's happened or if something's been prevented. Because mm -hmm. you're not mm -hmm. always, yeah, you don't you don't always know what could have been lost if it hasn't happened. And so it's kind of like uh, the, the the problem is showing not a return, but like a, a potential, you know, time, money, reputation saved by implementing cybersecurity solution, whether they be technological or or training, uh, such as what we do. Um, so, for instance, what uh, one of our key features in that is we show analytics to um, to CISOs. Uh, showing them how many employees clicked simulations, how many uh, are considered high risk and stuff. So there's always like a picture of uh, what's going on in the organization. But again, there's still a gap in what we can show. We can't say if this employee had clicked, what would have happened? We, d we don't know that. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe the CISO knows because they know the person, they know the department, stuff like that. I, I think one of the things we've seen that helps is comparative analysis. So if you can show a uh, comparative analysis, you know, for instance, with phishing, if it's, hey, you know, in, in all organizations, you know, 28% of people click, you know, in PCI, that's 50% of people in, you know, semiconductors or healthcare, it's 12%. You know, Brad, so you're giving you me go, what's that? You're giving me heartburn with those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever it is, you know, whatever the numbers are, but if you can show what we've been asked for a lot is comparative analysis to both industry and then peers in the industry. And then, you know, how can I get better? So having that, you know, full, as you mentioned, the hoodaloop loop on how do you actually get better in the full cycle? I, I think, you know, provides a, that level of comfort that, that Bobby mentioned earlier and, and level of trust is how do I trust the person that's, you know, managing, you know, our cyber risk is, you know, how do they compare with the money that I've given them compared to others and what are they doing and, and how does that come all the way back, you know, to, you know, remediation and change? Yeah, yeah. And can I add uh, another uh, potential risk uh, with this knowledge gap if it's not closed, uh, specifically for board members? Um, because they, you know, a lot of board members reside in boards for several companies. And so it makes them a very juicy target for attacks. Uh, because if you got one person with a lot of, you know, um, classified information about a company, especially in, with, a, with regards to M&As and stuff like that, information that could be used in the stock market later on. Uh, so the, they become themselves very, very um, interesting targets for attackers. That's yeah, I, uh, I mean, absolutely. absolutely. Well, Let's kind of go on. I, I, I kind of like the direction that we've here, headed. And, and from my like key takeaway is that, you know, the knowledge gap has led to a strategy gap um, that, that we're, we're facing. But let's 
let's dive into this a bit. And I'm going to go over to Aaron first. And I want to know, you know, this this gap that we're facing, be it knowledge, being it strategy, do you feel I, I think we can all agree it exists? I think I think I think we're all we've all given plenty of reasons why we we think that it exists. Can it be closed? Uh, Aaron, I want to hear your perspective as you know, someone that's a, a you know a, a long time engineer that's that's on the grounds working on the te technical implications of these things, particularly in the cloud. Can we can we bridge this gap? Oh, I I think that there's absolutely ways we can bridge this gap, but uh, there were a couple of points uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna carry in from the last conversations to answer this one. Uh, the first thing is we are fighting an asymmetrical battle here, okay? So it, it costs next to nothing to to generate some of these phishing emails, and it costs mm -hmm. you know a disproportionate amount of time, effort, and energy, and just flat out dollars to buy these solutions. So one of my strong beliefs is that we need to build systems and processes that actually empower people further down the line. And th that's really kind of comes back to empower your leaders to get the tools they need to respond to the threats that are coming out. Uh, I would say that, you know, after the XZ utils uh, fiasco that we've been going through this last couple of weeks, like maybe an organization should be really looking at supply chain for their software development process. And maybe we need to be enabling those engineering leaders to buy or implement those tools without having to run it all the way up the flagpole to the board, start some new key initiative, and then wait three, six, nine months before we're able to even get it financed. Um, so I think one of the keys to success here is to continue empowering further down the line to let these leaders that you've you've hired and you pay you pay a lot of money to these people to trust them to implement these solutions. Let's empower them to help get the solutions and get them in place. So that's really my thoughts. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. The amount of times uh, I work for a security vendor, and the you know the amount of times where someone is very excited to implement the solution, but it's not implemented well, and you know there there, there lies a gap in itself, and it, you know it's 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 not being effective and it's not being used. Um, Will and you know you've had some interesting perspectives on that. Well, you know, how do you feel? Do you think that this the gap can be closed? That we can kind of uh, bring this strategy knowledge gap together? You know, I, and I think I agree with Bob in the sense that there doesn't seem to be a knowledge gap, but there seems to be a communication and a strategy gap. And where I think this gap is fixed is where the board really goes into understanding that they need to have a very nuanced understanding of risk management. And additionally, as cybersecurity becomes a priority for the company, they need to balance those investments in security with other business objectives. But it's the responsibility of the security practitioners to give that board that insight that they really need to be decisive about how they spend in security. And I do think that there are areas where the board is going to struggle to maintain that level of knowledge, right? Cybersecurity is consistently moving. You have all types of attacks. You have attacks on cloud service providers like Microsoft. You have the XE's util stuff. We're still building software on, you know, open source projects that are maintained by two people globally. And so there's a lot of nuance that goes into this where if I'm a board member and I'm looking at applications we're building internally, a question I might have for my tech team is, what open source products are we using that aren't necessarily maintained, right? And, and should we be mm -hmm. using those? I think that's something that a lot of people want back to their boardrooms and the, X, you know, the XC utils sort of uh, uh, response and said, hey, you know, we could be potentially a victim of this in the future if one of these very popular libraries is hijacked. And I think that sort of took yeah. everyone back to say, hmm, is this the right way of doing things? Probably not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And a very and a very relevant topic, you know, being of some of the news that we've had over the last, uh, you know, <laughs> the last week with the with the XZ uh, library, as you, as you uh, point out there. I think uh, it's I, bad I wanna... news. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, I think it's bad news, good news. I mean, you know, the bad news is, is these events continue to occur. The, you know, kind of the, the, you know, bad news associated with that is, is it affects people personally. And so they're getting educated on what happened, what caused it. You know, people are reading it in the news with disclosure requirements. You know, they're, they're getting reported on more. And the details are, you know, somewhat uh, more involved, you know, in these news articles that people are reading. So, People are just by default getting more educated. They're more interested. You know, they have to be more interested with regulation. So I think we're closing the knowledge gap. There's always going to be a gap because it just evolves mm. so fast. But, you know, when it, when it hits somebody 
you know, I can't get my prescription filled. Uh, I can't, you know, get access to, you know, my tools. I'm getting, you know, notifications from everything that I log into that my password's been compromised. All of those, you know, kind of tick back in the brain that, you know, how is this? What's going on? What are we doing? How are we doing something about it? How does that affect my company? So I think there's just a, a desire to get more knowledge and people are filling themselves up with, you know, information in different areas. That might be good or bad, but I, yeah. I think it's closing the gap a little bit. Well, we're coming to the end here. So we have one kind of final question and let's, let's make this kind of a hot fire, quick round question so we can get to, uh, to, to everyone there. But um, if we can agree that the, you know, the, the strategy gap uh, it exists, you know, in the, in the boardroom, well, you know, what does closing it look like? What what does it mean for our strategy for security in general? What does it mean for the consumers? You know, so uh, let's let's go to this. What does a post strategy gap look like? Aaron, I'm going to head over to you first. Okay, I'm going to sell. Uh, this is my thought, right? Like that. It's uh, and I think I described it a little bit earlier on. But it's an organization that has the foresight to understand that they are not going to be working with perfect information, and that mm. they're in, working against an ev evolving threat capability. You know, landscape there, right? So uh, I would say that what I would look forward to is a is a board and uh, and a set of practitioners that are bridging that gap, uh, close the feedback loop. Uh, and then, then empower people to make better decisions uh, without having to run them up the flagpole. Uh, I think that uh, I think that that's really one of the key pieces to to being able to be more agile, move on your feet, respond to threats, and thus protect the organization better. Uh, absolutely, great points. I see. If I want to head over to you, what is a what does a kind of post knowledge or strategy gap look like in 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 your mind? Yeah. So I think basically. Uh, CISOs need to be equipped with the right tools to convey these messages to the board, um, be it different charts, graphs, or analyses of you know risk and benefit and stuff like that, and language. I think uh, if if CISOs and board members could speak a common language about risk, um, that would I think uh, bridge the gap a lot. So. The gap can never be closed down to zero because, as said before, uh, board members have a lot of things they need to juggle and balance, uh, and CISOs live to do only one thing. Uh, but I think if they can speak the same language about risk, I think uh, we can get it down very close to zero. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bob, I'm going to head over to you. You know, you know, what what does the world look like when the, the strategies are aligned? How, how how does that affect us? Well, I think CISOs have finally gotten away from being a defender mentality and they've adopted an attacker mentality as well. Uh, mm. When we think like the bad actors, what most people don't realize is uh, there is a significant amount of data that's easily available that the bad actors use to identify vulnerable endpoints and combinations of, of failures that they use to launch their attack. Uh, you know, you just talked about the EXZ uh, util backdoor. Uh, that data is available. Uh, you know, I can look at the entire supply chain I have and know uh, where in my supply chain that is because I'm using that data. So uh, changing that strategy to think like the bad actors, use the same data, use the same things they do, uh, you know, to get uh, a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, the, I heard uh, asymmetric warfare. I like maneuver warfare better. Uh, <laughs> able to be very reactive. That way. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, no, I, I I really really agree with that. Thinking like a, a bad actor and getting into the mindset. Brad, uh, going over to you now. You know what what does it look like for you in 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 a world where the strategies are aligned? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. I'll, I'll kind of pick up on what Bob said. Is one of the things about sharing information too is that the attackers have always shared information, <clears throat> and now the defenders are are sharing information better among ourselves. So that knowledge is is increasing, and in that, you know environment where we have better knowledge, we can make faster decisions. And in the game of mm. attacker and defender, speed wins. So we have to be able to make fast decisions based on knowledge. If we're sharing knowledge, we're getting knowledge, we're able to make those decisions faster. We can act on, on an offensive uh, avenue faster and better, and then react faster on the defensive angle as well. And I think that bridges the gap. Yeah. 
I love how everyone's responses seem to build on each other. I don't know if you coordinated backstage on this, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's fantastic. Will, I'm coming to you to bring us home now. Uh, what, is, what does it look like in a, in a world where the, the, where the strategy gaps doesn't exist, where the knowledge gap doesn't exist? No, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I was reading my notes and I'm basically going to echo what Brad and Bob said. But I think my, my, my response to this is the we need to focus on shifting from reactive measures to proactive and strategic cybersecurity governance. That is right there, in my opinion, how we close the gap. And once the gap is closed, we focus on those reactive and proactive strategic initiatives that are going to make us all secure. Right. Mm hmm. A a a absolutely. And uh, I, I love how it kind of aligned we've all been on this, where we start off in a direction. And and, and I, I really feel like this is, from my perspective, you know, the strategy gap uh, can definitely be closed and we can do this. And it's going to enable us to be able to move quick quickly, move more agile, uh, like what Bob uh, had mentioned through there and be able to kind of uh, build a, a not only a more secure world, but one where we can act faster and uh, and, and deal with everything uh, uh, in in very kind of concrete and, and productive uh, measures. So we're we're done uh, we're done now with the the questions part uh, of the uh, of the evening. So uh, now it's time for the sh kind of shameless plug. And Jonathan's back to 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 bring us here. Yeah, no, I'll do that. That way you don't have to get muddy with uh, all the logistical <laughs> what have you. Um, yeah, so Keeping as we clean. Close, for, first of all, I'd love to uh, thank each and every one of you for, for your time over the last hour. This has been a great conversation to listen in on. Uh, but before we go, I want to invite each of you uh, to do some self-promo, whether you want to plug um, a book, your, your podcast, a company solution, your Twitter or LinkedIn profile, whatever it is, 30 seconds or so. We'll start in reverse clockwise order with uh, Will. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Again, everybody, I'm Will Santiago. I'm the Senior Vice President of Black Point's Response Operations Center. Black Point Cyber is a 24-7 MDR servicing company. Uh, we monitor both the cloud and the endpoints. You can reach me on LinkedIn at Wilfredo Santiago or on Twitter, InfoSecFredo, and I'm happy to engage with anyone. Thank you all for the time. Thank you for yours. All right, let's pop over to Brad. Yeah, like Will, we're also a managed detection response company. Again, my name is Brad Taylor with Proficio. Uh, we're Global SOC as a service provider, which is Security Operations Center. Uh, we help companies on a global basis of all different types of, of industries to detect threats, respond to those actively, and then we also provide continuous uh, cyber exposure monitoring as well. Uh, happy to help you and answer any questions. Just hit us up at info at Proficio.com. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Right on. Uh, Bob, where would you like to send the audience? So uh, first, go out to blackkite.com uh, and subscribe to our Focus Friday. Uh, we uh, do risk intelligence on 34 million companies in the supply chain and a research team uh, every week. Uh, the latest threats, uh, how to react, how to identify. Uh, so there's a lot of good information. Uh, just subscribe to it. Second thing is I'd say uh, follow me on LinkedIn. I write a lot. I, I blog. I do some controversial things. Uh, and on my LinkedIn profile, there's a link to Amazon.com where you can get my book about OODA loop and cybersecurity. Right on. There we go. Um, Aaron, you're up next. All right. Um, so in closing, uh, once again, I'm Aaron Brongersma. I'm at the cloud team here at Checkpoint. Uh, Checkpoint is a, uh, is, is a very mature cybersecurity company um, that, uh, that has a very comprehensive suite of cloud native and, uh, and cloud focused security tools. I would say that the, uh, the, what I wanted to plug today, uh, I actually wanted to give a shout out to our WAF team. Um, I know where uh, I was on December 9th uh, when uh, the Log4J vulnerability came out in, uh, in 2021. Uh, I can tell you, I was at home asleep in my bed because our WAF product blocked 100% of Log4J attacks for 100% of our customers. Uh, it was one of those, uh, we, we have a, a really smart AI engine that powers our WAF, and that team's really, uh, really uh, kicking butt over there. So thanks for having me on the, on the show here. And uh, if you're looking for some cloud security technologies, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Excellent. Thanks for being here. Uh, Asaf, what about you? Yeah, so uh, Asaf Sagi, head of product in CyberReady, and uh, I want to invite everybody to go to CyberReady.com cyber uh, if you want to train your organization against, you know, incoming phishing attacks and whatnot and cybersecurity awareness uh, in general. We, we provide a platform to help train your employees automatically, like almost zero touch, basically, is 
as autopilot as you want it to be. And uh, we um, we use yeah. phishing simulations with uh, just-in-time training. So when they click, they see uh, training that re relates to the attack they, they just saw. And we also have uh, security um, awareness security uh, bytes we send. And um, uh, yeah, so please come and see if you want to complement your other technological um, solutions. Right on. And last but not least, our moderator, Mackenzie. Yeah, so uh, I want to give a shout out to GitGuardian, which is uh, a code security platform that I happen to work for. And we, we specialize in detecting risks like secrets inside your source code and your networks. And I'm also going to give a quick shout out to my podcast, The Security Repo. If you're interested in hearing from great insights on security, you should check out The Security Repo podcast wherever you get your podcast fix. All right. Thank you, one and all. Appreciate your time again. And as for you watching at home, if you missed any portion of this discussion and you'd like to rewind and go back and watch it, it will be available uh, forever, ostensibly, on our YouTube and LinkedIn channels. Uh, our YouTube channel is brand new, youtube.com forward slash at Insight Jam. We're up over 38,000 subscribers. You don't want to miss the party. Join over there. Subscribe. You'll get to see uh, long form discussions like this, uh, short advice from experts, our podcast series. We have a few different ones launching and running every day. Uh, and of course, we also want to plug insightjam.com, our social media community for enterprise tech, an always on destination where you can interact directly with experts within your field and get a lot of excellent, uh, well, insight from everyone over there. Um, don't go anywhere though. We'll be back in one hour with our next and last panel of this mini jam live. Will AI pose a threat to the ERP marketplace? That starts in one hour, 4 p.m. Eastern. But until then, I want to thank everyone here on this group one last time for your expertise uh, and your time over the last hour. Really appreciate it. My name is John, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.